boring, sickly. sickly. Oh, I don't want to hear that. She was, but she was sick before we ever stopped coming to church. Back in January, forever it seemed. So I hope that you saw a, a purpose here because we started the year with, with a theme, didn't we? Again, not necessarily guided by me. I can't take credit for that. I'm not that smart. We started by getting back to the basics, being rooted in scripture, growing in our faith and maturity and, and sharing, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who knew we were gonna be stuck, quarantined at home, right? And we were gonna need that rootedness. We were gonna need that ability to grow on our own, that ability to spread from wherever we are. We were gonna need all those tools, weren't we? I can't take credit for that. I hope though that somehow this week, uh, and, and take this the right way, but I hope your foundations were, were broken. I hope the things that you thought were real and true were torn apart so that you could build a foundation upon Jesus Christ. He is the thing that remains the same. No matter what you face this week, no matter what you face in the, the weeks before today, God has been there. He's done that. And he's already going ahead of us now as we speak. God's word never changes. I was listening to uh, the Carrie Newoff Leadership Podcast and, and Annie F. Downs was on there. She, she had a, a situation where she was exposed to some people. She was quarantined. Uh, I'm, I'm talking no leaving, no going anywhere, uh, stuck at home for 40 days, right? Everything had to be delivered to her. She couldn't even go out. Um, she has no, she's not married. Uh, she doesn't live with her family. She has no pets. She's literally stuck in an apartment with her own self for 40 days. That would, I would go crazy. <laughs> I'm lucky I have, I have this crew to, 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 to be in quarantine with me if I need to. But she said that the one thing that she, she started was reading through the gospels. And she started reading through the gospels and she got to Luke chapter two. Everybody knows Luke chapter two. Even Linus knows Luke chapter two. He says it in the Charlie Brown Christmas story, right? There were shepherds in the field watching over their flocks by night. You all know, the, you know, know how that goes, right? And she said, I just began to sob. I just began to cry because God, here was God speaking to me. You know, that, that, that scripture that was really important to you in December at that Christmas Eve service that, that was so emotional for you, guess what? He's here right now, and I'm the same God of that moment as I am this moment, and I'm not going anywhere. Hopefully, you've had that experience. Hopefully, you've engaged in that. Today, we're going to shift gears a little bit because of where we are, right? We're, we're in the midst of this thing. I mean, you, you, it's obviously, all you got to do is look around and realize it's not normal, right? It's not the same. There's something different. Yeah, every other row is missing. You guys have done a really good job of splitting apart. Those of you that don't live in the same house, you've done a good job of spreading out. That's good. Some of you are wearing masks. That's good. It's different, but yet it's still kind of the same. When you get to communion, it's even more different, but we'll, we'll make it through. Today, we start this message for here in June, and we're gonna talk about pandemic, now what? We're going to go back to what it was. How did, how did the first disciples, these new apostles of Jesus Christ, when it came time for them to gird themselves up and begin the church, how did they face it? They were exiled, right? They were made fun of, persecuted. They were murdered. They were imprisoned, all for believing in this Jesus that they knew existed. They knew he was real. They knew all of this was the truth. And so how can we, as believers, stand firm in our faith and stand for what we believe in in the midst of what's going on around us? Keep this short and to the point. Jesus is calling you to do something. That's a capital D-O. This is not a, a, a participatory relationship. In other words, you can't show up Sit still, smile, clap, laugh, 
and get a trophy. That's not the way he works. Jesus is asking us to do something. This is exactly how the book of Matthew ends. We just read it. I just read it, right? What, what does he say? I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. Do you think when you read this or when you come to church and hear this, do you think that this message, well, this is cute, this was for the disciples, they really needed that? Or do you think, wait a minute, I'm a disciple. At least I call myself a disciple. I'm a follower of this Jesus. So I call myself a disciple. So is this for me? Maybe this is speaking to me. See, I don't think, I don't think that this Jesus would, would sacrifice his life for you, call you into this relationship with him so that you could sit around and do whatever. I think he calls you into this relationship with him so that you can be and do all that these early disciples were. Remember Jesus saying to them that, oh, you're gonna do greater signs and wonders than I ever have. And you remember me saying last week, why? Why do we not do that now? We're not engaged. We don't engage with the Holy Spirit. We don't say, sure, Holy Spirit, let's do it. We're not listening. We don't have time. We don't make and carve out space for this relationship in our life and therefore we are, should not be surprised when it flounders. He gives us action, right? He says, go, right? First word, go. That means you've got to step away from this, right? The, the building, the, 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 the quietness, the space you're in. Uh, the word go requires movement out of or to something. So the word go Make disciples of all nations. Notice he does not say, go, make disciples of just your friends. He does not say, go, make disciples of people that look like you. He doesn't say, go, and make disciples of people that agree with you. He says to these men and women here in the, that moment when he's getting ready to leave them, go and make disciples of all all nations. I don't, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't be worshiping today if Paul and, and Peter and, and Timothy and, and several others decided that the Gentiles were in on this too and that we should get out there to everybody. We wouldn't be here like this. We wouldn't be experiencing this Christ. He says, teach, teach them all that I have commanded you. Now, I hope that you brought your own snacks because we're gonna go through every time Jesus commanded them to do something. I'm kidding. We don't have that kind of time. So instead, I'm gonna give you Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Because he was very good at summing things up and getting to the point when he wanted to. Now there's sometimes when he's really wordy, but Jesus could oftentimes get to the point of what he wanted to say. He's, he's in, in, in this moment, Jesus is being uh, cornered. Uh, they're trying to get him to slip up and say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And so Jesus is def, def, hopefully gonna defend himself into his own imprisonment basically. And so they asked him, well, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. So it's right up there with loving God with everything you've got. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus tells them, the entire law, in other words, every command can be summed up in these two commandments. 
He says, the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Every other commandment, if you really want to break it down, every other commandment comes from love God with everything you got and love your neighbor. Everything. Everything stems from that. Everything flows out from that. Love God, love your neighbor. Oftentimes, translation, love your neighbor as yourself. We struggle with that because we don't even know how to love ourselves very well, do we? Two simple commands, and yet, if we choose, we can turn on the television and we can see evil in all its forms taking place all over the world. Instantly. People killing people. We see hatred, bigotry, racism. We see everything that Jesus was facing in his day and it's still alive today. People say, man, if God, if this God is real, then why are we spending thousands of years in this cycle of death and murder and hatred? We've answered that question if you've been paying attention the last couple of weeks, right? This is not the end. This is the world where evil exists. This is the world where as long as evil exists and people have free will, they have a choice. They have a choice to choose that evil. So do you. But we also have a choice to follow the disciples' lead. The Holy Spirit came to them. They did not deny it. They did not turn away from it. They did not question it. They were like, yes, this is exactly what we've been waiting on. This is everything that Jesus said he was going to do. And so when they accepted this task, they began to embody everything Jesus said. Teach them to obey the commands I've given you. Love God and love your neighbor. And if something that you're doing doesn't involve one of those two things, then it's probably not good. We can find Peter and Paul and many others imprisoned unjustly. And what were they doing? Were they angry? Were they fighting? Were they unleashing the sword as Peter did in the garden? No. We find a different perspective when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They began singing praises when in chains. So much so that, that in Paul's case, the the foundations shook and the prison doors flew open. Peter the same way. Peter was praising. He was literally shackled to a guard on each side of him and was literally just praying his way through the night. And those shackles were loosened and he walked out of prison. Love God, love your neighbor. They wanted to make sure that they were fulfilling Jesus' commands. Now, many of us think that, well, we've accepted Christ. We've, we've welcomed ourselves into that relationship. He's forgiven me. That's true. And, and, and I'm a new creation, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to get through life and, and uh, we'll see what happens. You know, he's going to rapture who he's going to rapture. He's going to take up who he's going to take up. He's going to save who he's going to save. I can't change that. Uh, I'm just going to let this go. Unfortunately, in today's text, we find out that's not true. He wants you to go, right? He wants you to do something. He is commanding you to do something. He is not waiting He's not waiting for that moment to come back. He is waiting on us to get it right and bring heaven to this earth. That's what he's waiting on. You want to see that come? You want to see that faster? Then start bringing heaven to earth. Start being kind. Start being loving. Start being everything that Jesus is commanding you to be. Spread it. Let it, let it go like coronavirus, right? Let it, let it do it like that. Because we could use that right now. I'm, I'm not blind to the things going on in the world. Yet you guys know me and you know I am definitely not one to sit around and watch the news. I, I will absolutely let that preach from this pulpit. 
I am not one to sit around and dwell on things that the media is trying to convince me of or trying to make me believe. I am better off and better served by having a conversation with my neighbor. And that doesn't necessarily mean the person that lives right next door. I'm talking anybody. Your neighbor is any brother and sister created by God in his image. Whether you agree with them, whether you look like them, whether you like them, whether you dislike them, whether they're awful people, whether they're good people, he's asking you to love them. You're better served being in the world than watching the world. Because when you sit back and you watch the world, they're gonna convince you of how to feel and how to act and how to believe. I, I am gonna go to scripture. I'm gonna go to prayer. I'm gonna ask Jesus, how should I feel? Jesus, what should I believe? Jesus, what should I do? What are my action steps? How on earth should I make a difference right now? And so what I did this week, and I thought about it over and over and over, and I kept thinking, man, you've got to make a statement. You've got to, you've got to put something out there on social media. You've got to be heard. Your voice has to make a difference. And so instead, God kept speaking to me through my time, and he said, you know what? I don't need you for that. There's a million point two people out there whose voices are being spoken. Their voices are being blasted and, and people oftentimes aren't even listening or they're going to hear what they want to hear and they're going to condemn and destroy. You know what I need you to do? I need you to do exactly what you've been reading all week. I need you to love me and love your neighbor. And so I know people in my life and I reached out not on camera, not in a, a, a fancy uh, post on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Nope, I said an email or made a phone call to these people myself. They are African-American friends and colleagues that I love and care about. They have loved me. They've shined Jesus into my life. They've helped me understand what they're facing. They've helped me and loved me just for because I am who I am. And they have in turn shown me Jesus and how to love my neighbor. I reached out to them directly and I said, you know what, I love you. I can't, I can't put myself in your shoes. I can't, I can't experience the things that you've experienced in your life. I can't because I'm not you. But one thing I can do is I can be here for you. I can love you and I can care for you as best I can. You have my undivided attention because I love you. I got some responses. My favorite came from my professor MTSO, Dr. Irvin Smith, who took time in his ethics class to talk about his childhood and what it was like to grow up in Augusta, Georgia what it was like to have to make sure you go to the bathroom before you leave the house because as soon as a, a, a man who was black left the house, there was no place to go to the bathroom. There was no place, and in some instances, there's no place that any of his family could go to the restroom. There were places that which he wasn't even allowed to go in. And here this guy was caught and torn between two things. He thought, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I wanna be angry about this. I wanna be upset about this, like, like my, my, my family and my friends in my neighborhood. But yet that God is also calling me to believe that he is who he says he is in this book. And he stood against a lot of things on both sides. And he went to seminary, he went to college, he became, he got his doctorate, and he still sees it all the time. I told him, I said, I can't, I can't walk in your shoes. I'm not, I'm not you. But I can love you as best I can. Friends, I don't think that I needed to address anything or make a statement from this pulpit other than Jesus commanded me to love Love God and love my neighbor no matter what. And that's what I'm gonna do. I take his direction and I take his guidance above anything else. I have to roll with how he rolls when he's talking about the Samaritans in his day. 
He walked right up to the Samaritan woman at the well. He shouldn't have been talking to her, not by their cultural standards, because she was a Samaritan. Oh, you don't talk to them. And she was a woman. Yeah, you don't talk to them either. He stood next to the woman, the adulterous woman who was about to be stoned in the middle of town. Oh, you can't do that. He did. Go back and read the story of the Good Samaritan. Find out why all of these proper folks passed by. And yet this Samaritan who was despised, his race despised by these people, cared and took care of that injured person. If this Jesus is who you're following, then this great commission should be something that we take seriously. It should be a part of a job description that you are willing to accept and you are willing to take hold of. I hope that you are, and I hope that Christ is seeing you taking this seriously and that his relationship with you is more important than the opinions of the world. Amen. And so with that, I hope that we will find our way to gather for communion. This is not going to be like communion you're used to. Anybody, can anybody tell me if you've done it this way before? You had your own little all-in-one cup right here in front of you? Um, Before I get too deep into this, uh, I I will uh, point out the obvious, maybe for some. There are two, two separate peel offs on the top, okay? There's, there's one that, that kind of is clear, but it's got the purple cross marks on it. That, when you peel that off, that reveals the wafer. And then there's the other one that's kind of attached to the hard plastic piece. And that, when you peel that back, reveals the juice. Tastes like a, 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 a melted purple popsicle. That's what it tastes like, in my opinion. Would you pray with me this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for being here. We are grateful that you have chosen us to speak into us and into our lives. God, we pray now in this moment of Holy Communion, celebrating the, the, the response that we have in remembrance of your son's sacrifice for our sins, that you would come and be your body and your blood in these elements of wafer and juice for us. That you, God, would see us, you would cleanse our spirits, and you would renew us with great strength as we leave this place to go and face the world. God, we give you thanks and praise for the work of your son, Jesus. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would restore and and clean our hearts, that we would be made new today, and that you would reign forever in our hearts. Amen. And so as Jesus and his friends gathered for what would be the, the, the last meal that Jesus would have, the last supper he would partake of, they're in the upper room and they're part of the Passover feast. And Jesus takes the loaf and he lifts it to heaven and he blesses it and he thanks his father for it and he breaks it. And he says, friends, this is my body, which is given for you. And likewise, he took the last cup of the night He lifted it to heaven. He thanked his father for it and he blessed it. And he gave them these new words. And he says, this is my blood of a new covenant between you and God, poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many and for you. And as often as you partake of this, remember me. So, top piece comes off, right? Your wafer is ready, if you haven't already. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) If you haven't already. The body of Christ 
given for you. <laughs> Take and eat. Mm. Mm. And you take the next piece off. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. May you take and drink and remember. And then you've got that little bag right there that you can put your cup in and seal that up. And that's all yours. There you go. How about that? Let's pray. Great and wondrous God, it is clear. No matter the substance, you are present in your body and your blood. You still have the ability to change our hearts and our lives, and you still have the chance to work in us and mold us. God, we know that none of us will be what you want us to be overnight. We know that we cannot instantly become everything that you desire for us. But God, please give us a heart of effort, a heart of trial, a heart of struggle, a heart of working hard to be everything that you've called us to be, that we might love you above all things and love our neighbor as ourselves and as the, you love them, no matter what. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who makes this all possible by his sacrifice with the strength, power, and guidance of your Holy Spirit that's here with us now. Amen. And so if you are able to stand, I would ask you to stand and join in our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Song.
more words of Jesus. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus basically tells us what's going to happen when the end comes. He says, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, but Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And then the king will turn to those on his left say away with you you cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons for i was hungry and you did not feed me i was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink i was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home i was naked and you didn't give me clothing i was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me and then they will reply well lord when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Friends, I pray that you will be like the sheep that God will find you being love and grace to people. You'll be feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, there for the sick, and inviting strangers, loving your neighbor is what that means. Hopefully, and I pray this week, God finds you loving him first and loving your neighbor second and everything else falls into place. Go in peace today. Enjoy your week and we'll see you again next week. Amen. Because